Dr. John Walton uh, is a PhD from Hebrew Union University. He's an Old Testament, Old Testament professor at Wheaton College in it, um, Illinois. He's taught there for almost 20 years. Prior to that was Moody Bible College. Dr. Walton has published nearly 30 books, probably 30 by now. He keeps publishing new ones. Uh, among them, commentaries, references, textbooks, scholarly monographs, and popular academics work, academic works. He was the Old Testament general editor for the Cultural Backgrounds Bible Study, which is really helpful. And perhaps uh, most widely known for his Lost World books, that's what we're, uh, we've really pushed here because that's probably the most accessible works that he does. Uh, the Lost World of Genesis 1 and The Lost World of Adam and Eve are back there on the table. He also has, he has now six, I believe, in that series. His areas of expertise in include the importance of ancient Near East for interpreting the Old Testament, as well as the dialogue between faith and science. And this is why we flew in Dr. John Walton today. So, John, let me, let me hand this over to you. And let me... I don't want to make any assumptions today. Um, I don't know where you're at uh, in your journey with God. So, but I, I'm going to ask that wherever you're at, that you would just, um, one, be nice. And two, um, if, if it's outside, just uh, participate so far as you are comfortable. So I'm going to pray for us. I'm not assuming anything on that. But um, if you would, just uh, take a moment to close your eyes. And I'm going to talk to God. If you believe him, join me. Father, we, uh, we thank you for this morning and this opportunity to uh, have our minds and hearts expanded for you. I pray that wherever we're at, people in the room today, Lord, that this will be help them. This will be a marker um, along the journey that will help them and help them as they try and guide others on the path uh, to knowing you, to finding you, um, to learning about you. And pray for John, pray for his words and, and this message, and thank you, Lord, for this morning. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for coming out on a difficult morning and a Saturday morning. It's wonderful to see you all, and it's wonderful to see some of the kids here. That's great. So uh, we're going to cover a lot of territory today. I've been on a quest my entire career, certainly my entire adult life, a quest to try to figure out how is it that we can be faithful interpreters of Scripture. Now, I don't know where you stand on Scripture. I suspect most of you believe a lot like I do, that it's God's Word, God's revelation to us. And that being the case, we have a, a stewardship. We have an obligation to handle that well. Otherwise, that great gift of God is wasted. If we only use it to do our own things, if we misread it for whatever reasons. And so we all need to be on this quest to be faithful interpreters. Now, when I start this discussion, then it always has to start with the question of authority. And I'm trying to get my thing to work here. Yeah. Okay. Authority. That's because, for me, the Bible has authority. Again, some of you might be in a different place on that. But if you are, at least you can listen and hear how Christians approach this topic. And because sometimes there's misunderstanding about how Christians approach this topic. So authority is how we started trying to figure out how we can be faithful interpreters. Now, for that, we have to figure out how authority works. Christian belief has traditionally understood the idea that God had purposes, communicative purposes, and that God carried out those purposes through human intermediaries, through human instruments. We call them the biblical authors. And so God chose to use that process to communicate with us. And so the human purposes of those people who were writing and speaking, they are reflecting God's purpose. 
And so in that sense, the authority of God is vested in those instruments. That means if we want to understand what God has to say, we need to understand what those human authors are saying. That's how he chose to work. In that sense, we have an accountability, an accountability to the human instruments who have produced our Bibles. And that accountability is important because if we're going to understand biblical truth, we have to understand it in light of what they were intending to communicate. And if we're going to understand what claims the Bible makes in any area, whether it's human origins, as we're talking about here, or if you're talking about any of the social issues today, we have to understand what claims the biblical text is actually making, because sometimes there's misunderstanding about that. And that's what we're going to be exploring today. We're not going to be looking at the science. You're going to have other lectures to do that as this series moves on. But we're going to be looking at the biblical text and what claims it makes. Now, once we understand that the text is working th by means of these human instruments, we understand that even though the Bible is written for us, it is not written to us. It's not in our language. That's why you need translators. And if it's not in our language, it's not in our culture, because language and culture are inseparable. And we'll talk about that more as we go on. This first section, I'm really just going to be talking about methodology. And then we'll have a break sometime in the morning, and then we'll turn our attention specifically to Genesis 2. So this first section, making sure we know what we're doing and how we should do it. So the Bible is written for us, but it's not written to us. We believe its message is for everyone, but we have to do some work to get to it. God could have communicated it fresh, you know, once a century to every language and every culture. God could have done it however he wanted, but he didn't. And we have to work with how he did do it. So if we're going to get to that authoritative message, if we're going to understand the claims of the text, we can't understand them against our world because it was not written to our world. We're reading someone else's mail. Instead, we have to try to get to their world. Now, I use a metaphor for that. It's the metaphor of the cultural river. And so we need to immerse ourselves in their cultural river. And I want to spend a couple minutes unpacking that idea because it's very important for how we approach the biblical text. So let's think a little bit about the cultural river. Let's start with our modern cultural river. What am I talking about? What's our modern cultural river? Well, it can be defined in lots of different ways, and I've got lots of words coming up on the screen that just give you an idea. We could multiply that by 100 more. Um, but th these ideas are uh, political, economics, um, values, uh, ideas that carry significance for us, uh, all of these kinds of things that define our modern culture. And some of those things we like, and some of them we don't like. And different people would feel different ways about different ones. Some of them we're very comfortable. Matter of fact, we even think this is how it ought to be. And others we want to resist. You know, maybe you're pretty comfortable with individualism, although not every culture is so individualistic as we are. But maybe you're pretty comfortable with that. Maybe you think consumerism is a problem. And you don't want to be so much of a consumer. It drives everything we do, and it shouldn't, you know, OK? And you could resist that. You could say, I'm not going to be that way. And that's fine, but it's still our cultural river. It's the world we live in. And therefore, you can't just ignore it. You have to resist it, because it's very strong impulse in our world, in our culture. We have values, freedom, democracy, patriotism. And you can see this also includes science, scientific naturalism, Big Bang cosmology is part of this, natural laws. That's our cultural river. It's who we are. And again, whether we like it or don't like it, 
this is where the conversation takes place. All issues are worked out in this kind of context. And so we have to recognize it as fact. Now, there's something we should also recognize as we look at this list. And that is that people in the ancient world know nothing about all of these things. And it doesn't matter whether I'm talking about a Babylonian or an Egyptian or an Israelite. They don't know these things. They don't know these words. They don't know these ideas. They are not vested in them. They don't have to have discussion about them. They're not even things they would understand. So we know this well enough in, in some way because we know we don't expect to open up the book of Proverbs and find a verse about social media. We know that we don't look in the book of Kings and find some discussion about the merits of, uh, of a monarchy versus democracy. We don't expect to open up Deuteronomy and find a discussion of uh, capitalism or market economy. And we shouldn't expect to open up the book of Genesis and find a discussion of modern science. The Bible is not going to make claims regarding the specifics of our cultural river because God was communicating to them in their cultural river. And they don't know this cultural river. Now, some people might say, but wait. I mean, you've talked about how this comes from God, and certainly God knows all. And if God's the one that's communicating this text, he could put some things in there that maybe the audience wouldn't understand because they're in their cultural river. I get it. But, but yet they're there. God kind of wove them in in such a way that we could find them. An interesting idea. Certainly you can't object that God knows all. But the question is, how does that way of thinking pan out? when you think through it. First of all, you'd have to say, did God do that for every cultural river? Did he hide things in the text for them to find that pertain specifically to their time and culture? Medieval France, Byzantine Rome, Stone Age Borneo. Everybody has things hidden in there for their cultural river. I mean, after all, you'd have to be consistent and say God did it for everybody. We're not special. But secondly, and more importantly, from a methodological standpoint, let's say for a moment that he did hide things in there for us to find. Who's going to say what those things are and what they aren't? Where's the source of authority for those? Because after all, people could make words mean lots of different things. Where are we getting the authority to say, yes, here's an additional meaning that the author didn't know? Whose authority is that on? And if it's just on someone's imagination, that doesn't help us very much to be faithful interpreters. Because at that point, we're no longer accountable to the authors, the human authors, in whom God vested his authority. We're trying to do an end run and get straight to God. And if you're doing that, you're doing it on your own. And therefore, authority is in jeopardy. So, we have to think methodologically. We know that God gave his authoritative message through the authors. And therefore, we try our best to be accountable to them. Now, this process of trying to read our modern cultural river into the biblical text has a name. And it's called concordism. Concordism works with the idea that the text corresponds with facts. And if we see something in the world today that we consider a fact, then we can correspond statements in the text to that. Read meaning into those statements that are from our modern cultural river. But again, 
pause and think about methodology. This is a relief from an ancient Hittite wall panel. It dates to about uh, middle of the second millennium BC. Would you look at that and say, ah, the Hittites knew about baseball. <laughs> look at that. Pretty obvious, isn't it? Anybody could see that. The Hittites knew about baseball. Wind it up and pitch. You all chuckle, and well, you should. We wouldn't do that. But sometimes that's what we do with the Bible. Read a modern interpretation onto an ancient text. I was in the British Museum this summer, and I saw this picture. And I said, wow, the Egyptians knew about selfies. <laughs> and again, of course we all laugh, because we know we can't do that. We can't take an ancient monument and interpret it as if it's some kind of modern phenomenon. But we do it with the biblical text. With no hesitations. But the author cannot be given credit for those things. You have to say that God put it there for me to find. And we're bypassing the author who is our channel for authority? And in doing that, we are bringing authority to ourselves instead of the text. So concordism reads modern insights and culture into the biblical text. And they, people who do that feel justified in doing it. They think that there's a divine intention be, be beyond what the human author knew. Now, sometimes they'll justify that, but they'll say, prophecy? Right? The prophets didn't know things that were going to happen. So there are some things that are truth in the biblical text that God works out from the biblical text that the prophets didn't know. You're right. But how do we find out when there's something that the prophets didn't know that's God's truth? We find it out when God tells us through another author later on in the Bible. And that's why that additional explanation, the fulfillment of the prophecy, has authority. Because a biblical author told us. And even in prophecy, if we go making up fulfillments on our own, we're on our own. There's no authority in that. My quest is for the authority of the biblical text. So we have to use controls. Controls that will stop us from making the biblical text whatever we want it to be or what our traditions have suggested to us or what our intuitions are. Okay? So... In concordism, they consider natural revelation a legitimate source for external divine knowledge to be read in. Things they say, well, we can see in the world around us that God did such and so, so therefore I can read it into the Bible. No, just be content that the world around us is thus and so. We don't have to read it into the Bible, and indeed we shouldn't do so. There's an authority problem. So it assumes that the Bible anticipates our cultural river which I see no reason to assume and no way to carry out in respect of the authority of the text. It lacks controls. When we talk about methodology, we often talk about, this word may be familiar to you or not, hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is just the methodology that we use uh, in approaching the text and interpreting it. And hermeneutics requires controls. And we need controls because we can't feel free to just say whatever we want about the Bible. When you do that, you get the Crusades. You get the Inquisition. You get the Holocaust. You get Manifest Destiny. You get American slavery. All substantiated from the Bible. We need controls so that it's not us speaking, but it's God's word speaking. 
See, this discussion has to come before the Genesis 1, Genesis 2 discussion. Otherwise, like Paul just talked about, you know, they, they treat you like you're, you know, cursing your mama or their mama. And, uh, but the methodology has to be laid out. Why do we do the things we do when we interpret the text? And it all goes back to this issue of biblical authority. So, if we're going to get biblical authority then, recognizing the text is not to us, but for us, nevertheless, but if we're going to try to get authority, we need to abandon our cultural river, really hard to do, by the way, and try to understand their cultural river, really hard to do, by the way. Work. It takes work. It will, if you follow your intuitions, you will not be able to step out of your cultural river. And your intuitions will not get you to the ancient cultural river. The Israelites gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai after having escaped from Egypt, come through the Red Sea, endured the trials of the wilderness, and there they are to hear the voice of God. And they send Moses up into the mountain to go hear what God has to say and bring it back to them. Time drags on. And he doesn't come back. And they say, well, I guess he's not coming back. So we need plan B. I know. Let's build a golden calf and have a cultic cow party. What in the world are they thinking? At that point, you've seen the question, the problem, but nothing in your intuition will help you answer it. Nothing in kind of what you can pull out of the air, nothing in our cultural river will help you answer that question. Why would they build a golden calf, and what does that thing stand for? you got to know the ancient world. And so we have to learn about their cultural river. The ancient cultural river is a very different place from our cultural river. And again, I'm just popping up a few of the things on the screen for you to get an idea. We could multiply that by many, many more. But their cultural river is how they live, how they think, where their conversations take place. And just like ours, where we accept some things and resist others, so the Israelites were very much accepting of lots of the things in their cultural river, but yet God was trying to draw them out of some of those ways of thinking. Even when that was successful, and they understood how differently they thought than people around them, the whole conversation is still taking place in that cultural river, not ours. So they came to suspect that the mediatorial role of images was not the way they ought to go. But that's still the world they live in. That's still their cultural river. And we're not going to understand what they are stepping away from if we don't understand what the cultural river was. Now, Paul mentioned the cultural background study Bible that I was the general editor for for the Old Testament. Basically, that is a cultural river study Bible. All the study notes are trying to open up the cultural river of the ancient world, whether it's history or geography, archaeology, uh, ancient literature, ways people thought, manners and customs. That's that whole thing. It's a cultural river study Bible. They don't call it that, but it's a cultural background study Bible. But this, this is because if we're going to interpret well, if we're going to be faithful interpreters, accountable to the authors, we need to try to get to their cultural river. Now, this is uncomfortable for some of you. I know. I get it. Because we like to just kind of read the Bible as it is. I just want to sit down in my sunroom when the, in the morning as the sun's coming up and open up the pages and just let the truth of God's word wash over me. Good on you. 
but are we sure we're getting the truth of God's word if we, if we have no filter in place to filter out our cultural river and to try to get to theirs? So this is uncomfortable because it says the way I've been doing it might not be the best way. And that may be the case because when we try to read it as it is, that means reading it from our own cultural river. Because that's the only world we know. And if you're reading it from your own cultural river, it is inevitable that at some level, to some degree, you are imposing something foreign on the text. And that foreign is you and your cultural river. We can't help it because our cultural river is all we know. So if we're reading it without a filter, we're reading it in light of our cultural river. And so we find out, much to our dismay, that reading instinctively is not reliable. That doesn't mean it's always wrong. But it's not reliable because there are many various ways in which our own cultural river will flow over into our reading of the text if we're just trying to read as it is. And again, when we do that, we run the risk of diminishing the authority of the text because it has been, yeah, interfered with by our own cultural river. We have to be accountable to the author's intention, and that means we have to read it against his language, his cultural river. People talk about reading the text literally, but you can't read the text more literally than by reading it according to what the author intended. That's what we mean when we say read the text literally. It means we're accountable to what the author meant to say. After all, you can read the text literally even if you're reading a parable. That doesn't mean you read it as if the parable actually was historical events. You read it literally means that it was intended as a parable. You read it as a parable. When it says God is a rock, we don't read it literally. We recognize the metaphor, and we say that we understand what that metaphor means. So literally doesn't mean you wipe out every rhetorical device. But literal does require you to honor the rhetorical device and the intentions that the author has. That's how we read literally. If their intentions are rooted in their world, their cultural river, we need to recognize that if we're going to get the full truth of the text. So, the Bible in the ancient Near East. What's going on? First of all, I would say, some people who talk about the Bible in the Near East use the ancient Near East as a weapon that attacks the credibility of the Bible. That's not me. But people do that. And for lots of Christians, when they encounter people talking about the Bible in the ancient Near East, they're reading someone who's using that as a weapon against the Bible. No, no, I want to use it as a tool to understand the Bible better. Okay? So I th feel that we need to read against the ancient Near East because that's the cultural river. So the biblical text is embedded in that ancient world. After all, it's not culturally free. It's not a cultural vacuum. God didn't invent a new language. He used a language that was there. He used a culture that was there for communication. So Israel is embedded in the ancient world. Israelites are a lot more like Babylonians than they are like us. And I'm talking cultural river here. Certainly some of their theology, hopefully, is more like ours and less like Babylonians. But their culture... They're much more like Babylonians or Egyptians because they share a cultural river. So I'm suggesting that Israel is embedded in that ancient world, not indebted to pieces of literature. Oh, the Israelites just went into exile, and then they borrowed Babylonian literature, scrubbed it up a little, threw in Yahweh here and there, and poof, Genesis. 
No, see, I'm not saying anything like that. It's not indebtedness. It's embeddedness that we're recognizing. So in that sense, we're not importing something in. We're not imposing the ancient Near East on the Old Testament. You can't. You can't impose it because that's already there. That would like, be like somebody telling me, oh, come on, Doc, stop imposing Hebrew on the Bible. It, it's in Hebrew. <laughs> that's impossible to do. But it's the same with culture. They're in a culture, and we need to recognize that. So what go to the ancient Near Eastern texts? After all, you'd say, this is pagan mythology. Why do you care about what pagan mythology says? I care because it shows us the ancient world. Even if it shows us the things Israel did not believe, it shows us the ancient world. And so ancient Near Eastern texts can prompt us to think about the text differently. You say, well, do we, is there very much that we have? Over one million texts. And that's from Mesopotamia alone. Massive resource for opening up the ancient world to us. And if you say, well, how can you ever get into somebody else's mind? You can't. But you can get into their literature, and it tells you something. So these texts give us access to the ancient world, to that cultural river, which is foreign to us. And they can prompt us as they provide us with windows. Some people even say keyholes. Just kind of look through. Try to look into the ancient world, get what you can get, to try to understand that cultural river. Now, that has limitations, of course. It has limitations because we can't get into their minds. But we can get enough to do two things. First, we can get enough to start recognizing some of the places where we have our own cultural river influence that we have to resist. Even if we only get that far, that's progress. To recognize, oh, they weren't individualistic like we are. Now, that's progress. Maybe you can't figure out exactly what they were like, but just moving our own cultural river aside can be helpful. Secondly, we can find out enough about some things to make a difference. We can find out, for instance, that the ziggurat, which was the Tower of Babel, was a structure that was not built for people to go up. It was built for God to come down. And it changes the whole story. If we read intuitively, we mess it up easily. We need to understand the ancient world and what they were doing and why they were doing it. I'll tell you more about that in the sermon tomorrow morning. <laughs> Teaser, I know. That's the so, if we're going to be faithful interpreters, we have to be asking the questions they're asking. Because they're not asking the questions we're asking sometimes. I mean, remember, people are people. So it's not like people have changed. People are still selfish and greedy and sometimes gracious and altruistic. And people are people. But culture is a different thing. And so I'm talking about culture here, not people changing. But we need to ask the questions they would ask and look at the answers they give to the questions they're asking. So example. Nine-year-old Billy walks into the kitchen and says, Mom, where did I come from? <laughs> Panic. Uh, he's only nine. I wasn't ready to have this conversation. Um, OK, Billy, uh, sit down. Um, so a man and a woman fall in love, and, um, uh, and th then they want to get married, you know, like Daddy and I did. And, and 
then they decide they, they want to have some children. And she kind of wanders through the, the birds and bees and egg and sperm and, and whew, you know. And she finishes up and she says, well, so, so Billy, do you have any questions? He says, well, no, Mom, but Tommy says he comes from Indiana. You got to understand the question. <laughs> or else the answers are going to be way off base. So we have to realize we've got, we've got a task as we come to biblical text. So asking the right questions. Now, for that then, we need more than translators. You all know that you're working in a translation when you read your English Bibles. And you know that you had to have some kind of expert, some team of experts who had knowledge of the original languages to provide those translations. We know all of that, and we've kind of learned to accept that, well, that's just how it is. I have to read it in translation. And we figure, though, sometimes that that's all that was necessary to translate it. But that's not the case. We need more than a translator. We need cultural brokers. The idea of cultural broker is that we've recognized in today's globalized world and the, the diversity in our own country, we've recognized that it's not always enough just to translate the words. Well, what do they refer to? What cultural ideas are underlying those words? Um, and how do you communicate issues of culture that go beyond language? I was just using an example of this the other day, yesterday, in class. We were talking about the book of Judges. I said, we call it the book of Judges. Now, you've got something in your mind of what you think a judge is. And it's based on our own cultural river, our own society and culture, how it works. And we think of all kinds of things when we think of a judge. OK, uh, courtroom, you know, behind the bench, hearing cases, making decisions. OK, we have things that come into our minds. We understand culturally a judge. In the Bible, we, interp we translate this word as judges, but they don't do any of those things. They don't do any of those activities that we associate with judges. And so here, you don't just need a translator. This is the right translation of the word, by the way, but it just doesn't carry the same cultural picture with it. And a judge in the Old Testament is a military deliverer Wow, we wouldn't have thought of that. The translation is fine, but there's a culture underlying it that if we don't understand it, we're going to misinterpret the text. So a cultural broker mediates between text persons or groups of different cultural backgrounds to facilitate interpretation. And again, I mentioned the Cultural Background Study Bible, the Cultural River Study Bible, the Cultural Broker Study Bible, because that's what that tries to do, serve the role of cultural broker. You've got the Bible translated into English, but then you have the notes, which is the cultural brokering that takes place, because there's more to understanding the text than just translating it. It understands values, beliefs, and practices of both cultures and makes sure that understanding goes across. It works within the culture's belief system rather than their own. I know you feel like I'm taking the Bible out of your hands. That's certainly not my intention. But if we're going to be faithful interpreters, we need to be willing to go the next step. And that next step is accessible. 20 years ago, it wasn't. 20 years ago, this lecture would have ended with a, and sorry, you don't have any access to that information of the ancient cultural river. Well, I feel bad for you. Well, that's not the case today. You do have access, but you have to make use of it. So a cultural broker negotiates between systems rather than just imposing one on the other. It's not enough just to translate the language. We have to translate the culture. 
let me give you some examples of how culture can affect some things. In about uh, 10 days, we've got a newly minted holiday coming up. We call it Pi Day, March 14th. Think of the cultural connections you need to make to understand why March 14th should be called Pi Day. First of all, you need to know that sometimes with dates, you use numerical notations, 314 instead of March 14th. And of course, that's only in America because in Europe, they would say 1403. That wouldn't work. Europe can't have Pi Day. <laughs> okay, so you need to know about numerical notation. That's cultural that we do it that way. Secondly, you need to know some technical information. You need to know that there's this thing called pi, which is the relationship between the circumference and the diameter of a circle, and that that equals 3.14, only approximately, though, and you have to be willing to approximate that, otherwise you'd end up with 3.1415, da, 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 and you'd never find a day. Okay, so you need technical information. Thirdly, you need to recognize that there's some sound wordplay going on, that this Greek letter that's pronounced pi just happens to be a homonym with an English pastry that's called pi. And that also is cultural information. So you need three major pieces of cultural information in order to sort out why in the world we would call it Pi Day. But there it is, March 14th, therefore, is Pi Day. And so the cultural habit is developing that you go out and buy pie, which everybody likes to do. Do you see how culture is embedded in something that simple that we take for granted. One more. I'm, I could do this all day, but one more. How long is a football game? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Technically, a football game is 60 minutes, yeah, but don't set your watch. When the people in the kitchen say, um, when will the game be over? And you say, there's a minute left on the clock. That doesn't tell them anything. <laughs> because actually, the length is interminable. Culture. Behind everything. We can't communicate with each other for five minutes without something cultural being involved. And so when we read the Bible, we need to take account of culture. We're going to sort it out. But these are the issues at stake. So when we're trying to get into Genesis 1 or Genesis 2, we're trying to ask their questions. We're trying to penetrate their culture. We're trying not to think just in terms of our world of genetics and genomics and DNA and um, the human origins questions, evolution. That's our cultural river. What does their cultural river have to say? Because if we don't understand it in light of their cultural river, then the problem is that we're going to impose ours on it. And when we do that, there's little chance that we're getting the authority of the text. Now, this is our time for a break. And uh, so we'll get instructions here. Again, after the break, we'll get into Genesis 2. And then we'll have a, th a good time for Q&A. So, so a couple words. One, uh, if you start now taking notes about what you want to ask for Q&A so we, we can move through that quickly. Um, if you want to get on the wireless network, it's super secure here. So you already write this down. You go to the wireless one, and the password is wireless. <laughs> and um, anyone who needs prayer after finding out that Isaiah 40, 31, they shall m w those that wait on the Lord shall mount up on eagle's wings is not actually about Nick Foles. We'll have a prayer meeting over here afterwards. So you got 10 minutes. We'll, we'll bring you back in 10 minutes. Thanks. All right. The second section is going to be longer than the first section, but so please 
feel free, uh, if you need to use the restrooms or get some more food, feel free to get up and, and do that. I'm just going to keep right on talking. Now, the, uh, the things we've done already uh, have been hopefully provocative, stimulating. Maybe they've even been a little bit troubling, but now we get to the controversy. <laughs> but it's important to have the methodology and the theology in place because that always has to drive the way we do interpretation. As I tell my students over and over again, the strength of an interpretation is in the strength of the evidence that can be brought to the question. And that evidence is produced through theological understandings and through methodological principles. And so that's what's going to produce a strong interpretation. An interpretation is only as strong as its evidence. So I tell them we're really engaged in detective work. Um, we have a word, uh, some of you know it, I'm sure, exegesis, which is the analysis of the biblical text to do interpretation. And I tell my students that we are forensic exegetes. Forensic because just like forensic accounting or forensic medicine, you're building evidence to answer questions. And that's really our task in interpretation. So now we're ready to go into Genesis 2 and try to understand how our theology and our methods lead us to try to read what we find in Genesis 2 and to interpret it in the cultural river of the ancient world. Now remember too, I didn't say this, but keep this in mind, we never stop there. We have to start there, but we don't stop there. Eventually, of course, we need to bring it to our cultural river, but we want to make sure that we bring the message that is there, not one that we've imposed on it. So once we discern what the message is and interpret it, then of course, we want to find out how it's for us. After we figure out how it is to them, <laughs> then we want to figure out how it's for us. So this is not just an academic procedure that you know, treats the text just as an ancient document. That's all there is to it. It's God's word. And so we're going to be going those next steps as well. But we have to start where we start, with the text, with what it says, and with the ancient world. So that's what we're going to do now. Now to begin, we have to figure out what this section is in relationship to what's come before and what comes after. How does Genesis 2 fit in? One of the most important things to recognize is that we have a literary introduction in chapter 2, verse 4, that introduces chapter 2 as a new topic. Now, what's interesting is that most people in most traditions have assumed, I use the word assumed, assumed that Genesis 2 is a recapitulation of day 6. That in Genesis 2, we find out about God creating people on day 6. And you're saying, yeah, What's the, uh, are there other possibilities? See how strongly we are linked to our tradition way of thinking? Now, I always figure those things call for scrutiny. Maybe I'll come out the same way. Maybe I'll come out different. But I have to at least look and see what's going on. And people have always noticed that it's a little bit difficult to read chapter 2 into day 6, especially if people are thinking that it's a 24-hour day because there's an awful lot that goes on in Genesis 2 that would be tough to fit into a 24-hour day. I mean, Adam names all the animals. Whoa. Okay, so there's always been this sense of problem. Also, it looks like in chapter 2, God creates people and then, then the animals. And that's not what chapter 1 says. So there are enough issues that should lead us to say, okay, how does Genesis 2 relate to Genesis 1 and how would we find out? Remember, forensics. We have to build evidence. How would we find out? We can't just assume it. Okay, so one of the things we can look at is this literary introduction. It uses the Hebrew word toledot, and we learn very easily that there are 11 times where Genesis does this. 
where it has this introduction uh, using Toledot as it transitions between sections. So this is a stylistic thing that the author of Genesis has done to help us move from one section to another. Now, if this is a, a strategy, a rhetorical device, a literary characteristic that he uses, well then we can look at all of them and figure out what is the relationship between what comes before the Toledot and what comes after the Toledot. If he uses them consistently, we should be able to observe what those relationships are. Now that's what I've got written in the chart here. You can see the references down the first column and then the relationship. Okay, you can see that most of them are sequel. That once you pass the Toledot, you're into a sequel, something that comes after. Okay, you can see a couple of them are what I've called recursive. Recursive means it goes up and picks up the line of thinking, but in a different direction. So Genesis does this, for instance, uh, at Ishmael and Isaac. So it follows the genealogy of Ishmael, and then there's a Toledot, and it comes back to Isaac. It's not telling the Ishmael story again, so it's not recapitulation of Ishmael, it's recursion where it comes back in time and now picks up Isaac and follows his line, obviously different from Ishmael's line. And you can see that there's a couple of them that are recursion, but they always deal with family members. You know, when you follow one line and then you come back and pick up the other line. Okay, we have recursion in things like Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. Oh, mentioned it again. Uh, the Tower of Babel, because there it tells us that everybody's of one language. Yet in chapter 10, it kept saying all of these peoples with all their languages. So you know that Genesis 11 does not come after all of Genesis 10. Instead, there's recursion. It follows all of Noah's sons in three lines in Genesis 10. Then it pulls back to the beginning after the flood and talks about the Tower of Babel. Narrative recursion. Okay, so all we're doing here is tracking how the author uses this literary introduction. He uses it for transition and he uses it at times for recursion, but in very specific cases, and other times it's a sequel. It's never recapitulation. Now that should pop some warning flags up in our head because our normal approach to Genesis 2 has been to treat it as recapitulation of day six. And if the author never does that with these Toledot sayings, we ought to ask questions. What would it mean if Genesis 2 is a sequel and that the people in Genesis 1 are not Adam and Eve? Because Genesis 1 never mentions Adam and Eve. In fact, Genesis 1 focuses on population. Remember, God said, let the fish swarm, let the birds teem, let the animals come forth. God created people. Male and female varieties, populations, not individuals. Oh, man. That would suggest that there's a population around by the time you get to the sequel in Genesis 2. That would suggest that they aren't the only people around. And in fact, there are hints to that um, in, uh, in the text as we move along. So again, it's not recapitulative. If it's a sequel, then people in Genesis 1 are not necessarily Adam and Eve. And of course, that means that the second account, Genesis 2, doesn't need to fit into day six. That solves some problems. But there's a hint that there's other people around. For instance, when Cain uh, leaves, you know, driven away, he's afraid that anybody who finds him will kill him. Who are we talking about? Come on, Mom, Dad, stop it. You know, who's he talking about that he fears will kill him? He, he finds a wife. You know, 
Some people have tried the sister thing. I don't know. I just don't. I'm not comfortable. He builds a city. If you're building a city, you can't just build it for yourself. That's called a man cave. <laughs> I don't know the Hebrew word for it. <laughs> so there are hints, but that's not the Bible's task. Remember, the Bible is not trying to answer all your questions or every question a person could ask. It's got its own track. It's got its own agenda. It's got its own message, and we're supposed to follow it, not try to make it answer us. So we find that the literary setup makes it appear that Adam and Eve come in a sequence. It doesn't say how long after or anything of that sort. And even Adam and Eve could be part of that first population. We don't know. But it opens up the possibility of this population. Well... Wait a minute, Doc, I can hear you saying. Uh, but then what makes Adam and Eve special, different? Well, something does. But now we've got a researchable question. And we can try to find out what the Bible thinks makes Adam and Eve something different among this potential population. By the way, I don't know that there was a population, but the text opens up that direction without really resolving it because it's not trying to talk about that. So now we have to start talking about who Adam and Eve are. And I'm going to use the word archetypes here. And when I use the word archetype, I'm referring to a situation where what it discusses is something that pertains to everyone, not just to those two individuals. And I'm not going to suggest everything in Genesis 2 is archetypal, but I think there's evidence in the Bible that some things are. And so we should give those our attention. Let me start off with an illustration. I was on the internet, and uh, an interviewer was talking to second and third grade children. And he said to them, what are mothers made of? And one little girl said, mothers are made of angel hair and butterfly wings and clouds and string and a little bit of mean. <laughs> now it's interesting, here's this little girl and she's, she understands immediately that the interview is asking an archetypal question even though she doesn't know that word. But that's precisely the kind of answer she gives. It's about what mothership is about. And it's interesting that, of course, she identifies certain ingredients that somehow in her mind communicated something important about the identity of a mother. Not just her mother, but the identity of a mother. And as she talks about angel hair and butterfly wings, don't go biology on me here. Even though she's talking about ingredients, that's not about biology. That's about identity. A little girl can figure it out. And yet sometimes when we read Genesis, we're not as thoughtful. So I want to talk about Adam and Eve as, as archetypes. Now, in my forensics, if I'm going to make the case that there's an archetype, then I have to be able to demonstrate that the text, not my imagination, but the text gives us evidence that what they're talking about pertains to everyone and not just those two individuals uniquely. That's the task of the detective here. Okay? So, first of all, we look at their names. Those aren't their real names. They can't be their real names. How do I know that? Because those are Hebrew words. Adam means humanity. Eve, Chava, means life. And I know that they can't be their real names because Hebrew did not exist until after the time of Moses. 
the language didn't exist. So Adam and Eve could not have had Hebrew names. That means those are given names by Israelites who spoke Hebrew with a meaning that's connected to what they stand for archetypally. So already, the biblical text. Now, if your translation said, and so God made human, and then his wife, life, you'd read it differently. If you recognize those were really not personal names that refer to their historical names, you'd understand that someone is applying meaningful labels to them to help understand the role that they play. So already we get the hint there. Now, buckle your seatbelts. Chapter 2, verse 7. Our translations read, The Lord God formed Adam, or the man, depending what translation you're using, from the dust of the ground. And that, that's used very significantly in how we think about the biblical view of human origins has to be a special act of God down in the dirt making Adam from the dust. Problem. In the Hebrew text, the word from is not there. No one would disagree with me on this. It's not kind of a special pair of sunglasses I have. <laughs> the word from is not there. Well, then, why do the translations say it? Well, it's because they're trying to make sense in English of what we have in the Hebrew text. My rendering would be, he formed humanity, semicolon, and that break is there in the Hebrew text. I didn't make it up. He formed humanity, dust of the ground, which describes human identity. It's what we are. Didn't choose butterfly wings or angel hair, but doing the same thing. This communicates something about all of us. It is what we are. Dust to the ground. And that becomes a very different sort of statement and therefore a very different kind of claim. When we look at this word formed, and we tend to think that it's a very physical, material act. But when we look at the way that verb is used throughout the Hebrew Bible, we find that it's often not that kind of thing at all. We look especially at Zechariah 12.1, where in a context talking about origins, it says, and then God formed the human spirit. What does it mean for God to form the human spirit. It's certainly not a material act. But it doesn't talk about God forming the human body, but God forming the human spirit. The nefesh and ruach. Nefesh is the breath of life that he breathes in. Ruach is the spirit. And God forms that. God is forming human identity. And that's not a material act. And therefore not something that can be tracked scientifically. It's not making a scientific claim. Verse 
It's a totally different kind of claim that has great significance in the ancient cultural river because they too wanted to know who are we? What is humanity that you should be mindful of us? Psalm 8. Job 7 asks the same question. What is humanity that you should be mindful of us? But with Job, it's in the context of, so stop bugging me. Get off my back, will you? Pay attention to somebody else. Has two sides to it, that idea of God being mindful of us. But human identity. And, you know, it's interesting. It's not something that was only important in the ancient cultural river. Really, isn't that what so much of what we talk about is about today? Human identity? That's what we really need to know about. Not about biology. Not to downplay any biologists that are here. Biology is really important. But again, what are the big issues on the table? So identity. So our question is not, are people really made of, of dust, silicon? What's the chemical formulas? But rather, is this what people really are? Are we dust? And what would that mean? Now, it's interesting then that our identity is something that pertains to everyone, human identity. And we're going to talk a little bit later, image of God also pertains to everyone. We are the image of God. I'll get to that. Okay? And then what we also find out, notice I've been working with the biblical text here. Haven't touched the ancient world yet. Been working with the biblical text, what it says and doesn't say. But now, once we work in the biblical text, come to some conclusions, now we can go compare it to the larger cultural river. And what we find is, this is how they always talk in the ancient Near East. They're always interested in identity, and they use archetypal ingredients. Whether it's, they don't use angel hair, they do, they do use things like the blood of a deity, they'll use the, um, the spit of a deity, the tears of a deity, and those aren't biology. Those are identity, relationship that they have with the God. So here we have uh, a relief from ancient Egypt. The god Kanum is here on the right. A couple other gods there with the pharaoh. And here we have a human form on a potter's wheel. And Kanum actually is the, the artisan god, the potter. So we have the human human form, <laughs> I'll tell you why I'm having trouble with that in a minute, on the potter's wheel. What we find out is that this is Pharaoh. We've got text here. This is Pharaoh, and it's not about his birth. It's not about the god Kanum forming him as a human being biologically. It's about Kanum forming him on a potter's wheel, forming him as Pharaoh to be Pharaoh. This is at his enthronement, his coronation, not at his birth. And he's formed on a potter's wheel, his identity given shape. And so Pharaoh's identity is formed on the potter's wheel. We have the archetypal ingredients that I already mentioned. Sometimes the text uses clay. The Egyptian ancient texts use clay or blood or spit or tears. And the formation focus is on role and identity. That's what they were interested in in the ancient world. They have nothing in their cultural river that's about biology. Those aren't their questions and not the kinds of answers they're giving. And in the ancient world, they typically taught of, thought of humans being created en masse. No no example in the ancient world of an, an original couple from whom all came. That doesn't mean it couldn't be in the Bible. But if we do see in the Bible what I've already suggested, that there is a population kind of approach, that does happen to fit in with what we find in the rest of the ancient Near East. The archetypal ingredients fits in with what we find in the rest of the ancient Near East. It's not like I'm making the ancient Near East tell us what to believe. We already found it in the Bible before we compared it to the ancient Near East. 
And so we start learning that there's a different way of asking questions and giving answers. So that says at the bottom, no biological, no biological implications. All right, so now we're ready to turn to the claims of Genesis 2. First of all, of course, we have to adjust the title up there at the top. Uh, uh, there's no from. Is it settling into your brain how significant that translation difference is? How much we have built on that preposition? How much of our understanding of human origins and the argument between Bible and science about humanity is built on that preposition. And it's not there. So we're not talking about chemistry. That's not the way that they would think in that cultural river. They don't even have chemistry. Their periodic table is very small. Oh, they don't have one, of course. So they're not talking about chemical composition, but people seem to want to talk about that today. And that violates cultural river and therefore violates authority. It's not just craftsmanship. First of all, if it were craftsmanship, it could be have more of a claim to be craftsmanship if it talked about clay. You can shape clay, but the text doesn't say that. It says dust, and you can't shape dust. So we don't picture God down on his knees crafting a human body like Knum on the potter's wheel here, crafting a human body. If it's dust, keeps falling apart because they're you can't shape dust. There's something else going on here. It's not craftsmanship. And again, if it's not something material that's being formed, if it's the identity, you could picture it like the Egyptian one did with the pharaoh there, but that's not the point. Dust equals mortality. This is pretty clear throughout the Bible. Genesis 3.19 already tells us this. Dust you are, and dust to dust you will return. And everywhere throughout Old and New Testament, dust is treated this way. Whoops, don't go with that one. Come, oh, come back. Okay, go back. Sorry. Back, back. Okay. Oh, no. No, no. Back. Okay, I'll leave that one up. Okay. We are all dust. We are all mortal. This is something that pertains to all of us. And God created us, formed us as dust. That's before the fall. But if dust means mortality, that raises awkward questions. Because we tend to think that before the fall, people were immortal. And we even think that Paul tells us that. Not, not Paul here. He's good, though. He's good. <laughs> we even think that Paul tells us that in Romans. Because it says that we are subject to death because of sin. And we read from it. It doesn't say this, but we read from it that, well, that means before there was sin, there was no death. That's a, that's a step on our part. That's not what Paul says. In fact, Paul knows that people were created mortal, not immortal. And he knows that because of this line that I simply couldn't erase. Immortal people wouldn't need a tree of life. Paul knows there's a tree of life in the garden, and the tree of life is meaningless and useless if people already have immortality. They were created mortal, dust always refers to. They're, they're created mortal, but they were given an antidote, a remedy, the tree of life. 
And therefore, they had access to life, which was not natural in them, through the tree. When they sinned, right, they get driven from the garden. God sets the guardian up to prevent them from getting to the tree of life. It says it explicitly. And therefore, with Paul, we can say, we are subject to death because of sin. Because sin lost us access to the remedy, to the antidote. Be careful what you insist Paul is saying. I assume he knows scripture pretty well. So now let's move on to the rest of scripture. Psalm 103, this is a great verse. For he knows our form, he remembers that we are dust. A number of things to be pointed out here. Now, first of all, that he knows our form. Uh, that form is the noun, noun of the verb that was used in Genesis 2, he formed. Okay, but here, our form, God's not, it, the text isn't saying, God knows that we have two arms and two legs, a head and a nose. It's not that he knows our physical form. He knows our form that he gave us. And what he gave us was our identity. And he knows our identity. And that identity goes on in the next line to say, we are dust. So dust is part of our identity, our form given to us by God. And that dust is something that was not just characteristic of Adam and Eve. It is characteristic of all of us, our form, we. Just read in text, folks. So we are all dust. That's the identity that all of us have as human beings. We are dust. God made us that way. We got stuck there when we sinned and had no access to the tree of life. This is what I mean when I say that this is archetypal. Because dust is not just descriptive of Adam, how Adam came to be, and not how the rest of us came to be. We also are dust. Every human is dust. And Paul says this too, the first man of dust, as are all of us. First Corinthians, Paul's tracking right with us here or we're tracking with him either way, okay? If we are all formed by God and are dust, there's nothing to preclude Adam being born of a woman. Because we are dust, and we were born of a woman. There's nothing here that says Adam had some sort of different origin than us, because we're all dust. Ouch. It's not an account of material origins. It's an account of identity. It's intended to communicate what all humans are, not what Adam uniquely is. This is not coming out of Babylon. This is coming out of the Bible. Your brains hurt. There have been a couple explosions, and I see brains splattered on the ceiling. This is hard stuff. I'm stretching you incredibly, I know. This is why our first session was so important, to talk about theology and methodology, because we can only try to approach interpretation on those foundations. I didn't... I didn't Start with a conclusion and then try to work backwards and make it work. That happens often enough, but I try really hard not to do that. 
And so I'm trying to tell you how this comes out of a careful and I think faithful reading of the text. That doesn't mean that all of you will draw the same conclusions, and that's okay. But what you should be able to decide is that, number one, there may be more to this than I knew. That's an act of humility that we all need all the time. And secondly, that there are people who, who are going to get to a different conclusion than I do, but they're being faithful interpreters. They're trying to be God's people as best they can be to understand God's word. And too often in the church, we are willing to ostracize anyone who comes to different conclusions than we do. I don't want to look at the conclusions they come to. I want to look at the methods they use. I want to know what the theology that undergirds what they do. And if they're being faithful interpreters, even if I don't go the same route that they go, you know, they're one of us. That's brother and sister in Christ kind of deal. So sometimes we just have to recognize that the tent is bigger than me of what constitutes Christian belief and faithful interpretation. Ready to talk about women? I hope this is a good exercise in recognizing how many questions there are to ask that we haven't thought to ask. I tell my students all the time, the first act of a, of a good forensic exegete is curiosity. Try to ask questions you haven't asked before. Try to ask questions that the commentators aren't asking. Because it's only when we ask questions that we can start to look for answers. So a woman from the side of man. Does Adam believe, or whatever his name is, does Adam believe <laughs> that Eve was made from his rib? At this point you're saying, no, don't do this, don't do this. <laughs> he's asking the question, so that means he's going to you know, dash my world again. Okay, no, he doesn't. He doesn't believe that for a second. How do we know? Because he tells us. What's the first words out of his mouth? Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Not just bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. You know, you ever order ribs in a restaurant and you get just kind of bones with hardly any meat? I hate that. <laughs> but this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. What's going on here than a rib, folks? Well, but my Bible says rib. <laughs> okay, well, let's take a look at that. I mean, we know the meanings of Hebrew words, not because we have a dictionary from Moses. Boy, that would be nice, but we don't. Okay, we have to figure out the meanings of Hebrew words. And there are traditional translations, and lots of times people who work on translation committees don't have time to reinvestigate every traditional interpretation. I say that as a mea culpa because I've been on translation committees and they give you a whole book like Isaiah and tell you you've got three months and you cannot go back and recheck every word to see if it should be something different. So translations tend to kind of carry on with tradition. If no one stops with a question popping up in their brain to say, is that the right word? And sometimes it's a problem that words, words in Hebrew don't have an equivalent in English. Now what are you going to do? There are loads of them. In the, sorry to keep mentioning it, but in the Cultural Background Study Bible, I've got a chart at the beginning of the Bible that's got 60 common Hebrew words that don't have straightforward English equivalents. Things like shalom. Things like, maybe Paul has occasionally mentioned chesed, covenant loyalty, or something of that sort. These are he important Hebrew words that do not have clear English equivalents. Now you, you can't possibly translate it right. You don't have a word for it. But translators do the best they can. So when we look at a word like this, we say, how do I know it means rib? The forensic evidence 
of how it could mean rib was if you had lots of other contexts in the Hebrew Bible where it clearly, by context, referred to rib. That, that's how we determine it. We look at other occurrences. Okay? So, let's go looking at all the places in the Hebrew Bible where this Hebrew word, tselu, tsela, I guess it is, tsela, and where, what it refers to. When it's an anatomical. Let's look at them all, okay? Ready? We're done. <laughs> this is the only one. The only place in the Old Testament where this word is used anatomically. Then why, why, why is it translated rib? That's a long study in itself and a complicated one and not a, like everybody always had the same idea. But it turns out that the word is used about 20 times in the Hebrew Bible, not anatomically though, it's used architecturally. And when it's used architecturally, it refers to one side when there are two. Lots of times with the tabernacle or the temple, the north side, the south side, the east side or the west side. Okay? Now there you say, well, there are four, but it's contrasted to another one. And so one of the options back in church history is that this does not refer to a rib, but that it refers to a side. The Lord God took one of Adam's sides and built woman from it. That's different. Now, one of your immediate responses might be, well, that's pretty radical surgery. Cut in half. Well, God could do it. But wait a minute. Surgery? Really? What, what made you think surgery? Because you're in your cultural river. And you might say, well, it says God put him in a deep sleep. You're not thinking anesthesia. You're really not thinking anesthesia, are you? <laughs> See how you can start weeding out things in your own cultural river that you were bringing into the text. So now we have to start thinking about what in the world is this deep sleep? Maybe that can help us. And indeed it can. We start looking at deep sleep, this Hebrew word, in the Old Testament. And we find out that it can be a couple different things. I'm not going to go through them all. But the other main one doesn't make any sense. And this one does make sense. And so that's, that's what we're going to go with. And that is that tardema sometimes refers to a visionary state. So when Adam's in a deep sleep, he sees a vision. A vision of himself cut in half. And from one half, presumably the better one, from one half, woman is made. It's a vision. And what's the purpose of that vision? Not biology. Identity. What is the relationship, the ontological relationship between man and woman? They're the same stuff. That's important. And we miss it if we're trying to make it do science. So what do we find as the message of identity in Genesis archetypes? By the way, you're probably getting the drift by now. I would not call this an account of human origins. The reason being that when we, in our cultural river, use the word origins, we think science. So the minute we use that label, push the text into our cultural river and start thinking in those terms. Just like when you use the word judges, and what do you think, right? It's that kind of thing again. So the idea that this is about human identity. So human identity, uh, we're created with mortal bodies. That's who we are. That's how God made us. Relationship identity. Given the role of serving in sacred space, I've got a slide on that coming up, and we'll get to that one. 
serving in sacred space, because we're still thinking about this answer in the back of our heads, then what's so special about Adam and Eve? If it's not biological positioning, what is it? Okay, ontological identity, different from the animals. Adam needs someone to help him, and he names the animals, giving them their, recognizing their identity, and no, that won't work. So there's an ontological distinction the animals won't do the job. Gender identity divided into male and female would seek out new family relationship. Do you see that all of these actually are issues that we argue about and struggle with today? That doesn't mean that they're anticipating our cultural river. It rather indicates that these have always been issues in cultural rivers. Who are we? And that's not necessarily an issue of biology. Now let's turn our attention for a moment to the image of God question. How are we doing? Pretty good, okay. Image of God. Again, this comes in Genesis 1, not Genesis 2. Genesis 2 doesn't mention the image of God. So if you say, God made Adam in his image, or God made Adam and Eve in his image, you're merging passages over, f over yeah, having them over. flow into one another. And that doesn't mean I'm suggesting that Adam and Eve are not in the image of God. It's just that's not the point the text is making with Adam and Eve. It is the point that he's making in Genesis 1 where he's talking about the whole human population. In that sense, then, it's not a case of God deciding to select out somebody from that population and give them the image of God. You couldn't get that from the text here. Image of God is connected to the entire population. Adam and Eve's story doesn't mention it. Now, by the way, there are some people in critical scholarship for the Bible who think that Genesis 1 and 2 are two conflicting, contradictory traditions. That is not what I'm presenting, and that's not what I believe. But they are different stories, and we have to understand how each story is working. Okay, so first of all, in my view, and I, I'm not going to go through the forensics on this, I've got it, but I'm not gonna go through it. It refers to a corporate function that all humanity serves as God's vice regents. I get that main information by the fact that in chapter one, after it introduces the image of God, it tells them what they're supposed to be doing. Okay, so be fruitful and multiply. S um, subdue and rule. These are functions that they have. And so the idea that God has created people to work alongside him, to bring order in the world, and he a steward to work side by side with him. So that's a function. Secondly, we can talk about identity. Image of God is an identity that God gives. It's not something to develop. It's not like, well, I'm going to try to uh, be more the image of God. We are the image of God. It's a status, an identity. I don't know if the battery's going on this or not. An identity that we have, that God gave. And there's nothing that can be done to change that. We could live it out more. We could be more faithful to it. We could be better stewards. But that doesn't change the idea that we're the image of God. Okay, this one on. Okay, good. So you can hear me all right? It doesn't sound as loud, but that's okay. So God gave us an identity that gives us a status. We see God doing that in lots of other situations. I mean, think about our righteousness in Christ. That's a status that's been given to us, and we can't gain it, and we can't lose it. It's a status that we have, an identity. We are righteous as God sees us through Christ. It was likewise the case with Israel in the covenant. They were his covenant people, and that wasn't going to change. He defines that by using the term holy. Holy. 
sometimes in Leviticus 19, we see the translation, be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And that's not quite right. That translates it as an imperative, be holy. Hebrew text is not an imperative. It's an indicative. You are holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. They have been identified with him. And since he is holy, they are now holy. It's a status he gives them, not something they achieve, not something you can gain or lose. It's a status, and they have to live out that status, and they could do it faithfully or unfaithfully, but it's a status, and they can't lose it. And so this idea that God gives identities, an image of God is one of those, a status that he has given humanity. We can also, therefore, stand in as God's substitutes, endowed with his essence and representing his presence. That's what images do in the ancient world. There's whole studies on that of how images worked, either images of the gods or images of the kings and how they operated. And so substitute is one of the aspects that we find with image. So when we think of the image of God and its significance for us, uh, first of all, it answers some of those big questions of life. Who are we? An image of God has an important role to play in all of that. It provides a biblical view of who we are. This is what God says we are, and therefore it is what we are. It provides a start for understanding God's plans and purposes. His plans and purposes are going to be worked out through us. That's how God chose to do it. And it also provides a basis for a relationship with him. Now, again, remember, image of God is something that's given to the corporate entity, humanity, all humans, corporately, are image of God. I don't know of any passage that would allow me to say, I am the image of God. I am part of a group, humans, and that group is the image of God. And as part of that, I share in that. But I wouldn't be able to say, I am the image of God. It's the same as I could not say, and most of you would acknowledge this and agree with it, you can't say, I am the body of Christ. No, you're not. The church is the body of Christ. And you have a role to play. You are a participant. You are part of the body of Christ. And maybe you're an ear or an eye or a hand or a foot, but you are not the body of Christ. The corporate entity is the body of Christ. Again, remember in the ancient world, they thought in corporate communal terms. So this is not unusual. I would want to see passages that told me differently. And because I don't, I'm not quite willing to take that step to say I and the image of God. It's not something meant to pertain to an individual. Now, again, that creates some issues for today as well, because lots of times we use image of God as our defense for, you know, how should a person who is uh, born a vegetable be treated? How should the, the child in the womb be treated? How should a senile person who has lost all memory and identity be treated? You know, are they human? Are they image of God? Right? It comes up in all of those kinds of questions. And I'm not sure the Bible is going to help us answer those. If the Bible says that humans, by definition, are the image of God, then all somebody would have to say today is say, that person no longer qualifies as a human. So it might make some of our conversations trickier. But if that's the way it is, that's what we have to work with. We can't just jump to an easy answer that's framed in our modern world. There are different positions on this, folks. And again, I'm just trying to give some information. Remember, I'm not trying to um, build a band of converts here. <laughs> I just want you to have information to think through. Okay. So 
this is a slide I promised you. Maybe I should put this a different place in the, but so what makes Adam and Eve different? If they are not necessarily the first and only of the species, right? That's how we usually think about them. First and only of the species. But if there's a population all the way ready around, then that's not the role they have. But of course, their biological role is not first and foremost in the ancient mind, in the biblical mind, their cultural river. They wouldn't be thinking of that as very significant. So what special role do they play that singles them out for attention in Genesis 2? There must be something. So what have we got? Well, we've got Genesis 2.15, which talks about their role. Now, there it says that God had formed Adam, as I think, his identity. He puts him in the garden, right? He's not already in the garden. He's placed in the garden, and he's told to serve and keep. Now, first of all, you have to understand that the garden is not just lovely green space, a beautiful park, and, and growing my own little you know, potatoes here. And it, it's not that kind of place. Um, it's sacred space. And this is well known in the ancient world. You know, palaces and temples had garden areas that were lovely parks, a lot of flowing water, just like it describes here, growing trees, just like it describes here. And this was a place of audience. It was a place that was considered exclusive only for those who had entry permits, so to speak, for priests. Uh, you know, we have the temple, which is sacred space, and there are certain areas only the priests can go into. And so this idea of a garden next to divine residence is well known in the ancient world. And that's what we have here in the Garden of Eden. God is there. God is dwelling among his people. And because he is there, it is sacred. It's not like he goes looking around to say, where are some sacred space that I can go and land? Nope. It's sacred because God is there. Remember the burning bush? Okay, Moses, this has now become sacred space. I'm here. Shoes off. Okay? It's because God is there. So when he is put in the garden, he's given a task in sacred space, serve and keep. Now, serve is a fairly general verb here, and it can refer to lots of different kinds of work and service, depending what the context is and what the direct object is and all kinds of things like that. Okay, but it's also used, and in the Pentateuch, it's almost always used, for the work that the priests do in sacred space. This is priestly work. It's not landscaping, topiary, um, you know, lovely hedges. <laughs> it's, it's not harvesting and planting, although maybe they did some of that. But the idea is this is sacred space, and they are serving God who dwells there. That would be something that they could pre possibly have been chosen out of a population for that task. And it's a very important task. So work is sort of a general word, but it's used for priests a lot. And keep is also a priestly term and not a landscaping term. So it looks like they're put in there to do priestly tasks, which would make sense since it's sacred space. Eve is a helper. That does not make her inferior or subordinate. The most common use of the word helper in the Old Testament is to refer to God as the helper for Israel. That cannot, therefore, be subordinate or inferior. It likewise doesn't mean that the woman is God. Anyway, um, so she's his helper in sacred space to do this task of preserving sacred space. As priests, they are representatives of any population that's out there. That's not the same as archetypes. Archetype is everyone's just kind of the same as what it's described for you. Everyone's not priests. It's still a representation, but it's a different kind of representation. Priestly representation, therefore, differs from archetypal representation. And so here we have priests just as Israel is a kingdom of priests. Israel had stewardship of sacred space, of God's presence, the tabernacle, the temple. That was the task they had. 
Okay, a priest isn't just someone who offers sacrifices. Sacrifices eventually became part of maintaining sacred space and keeping it sacred. Okay, but a priest's role is guardian of sacred space. Okay, so Israel is a kingdom of priests. They are mediating knowledge of God and access to God's presence. Now, it might be at this point that you're thinking with all of this, good, with all of this, we've been talking about archetypes this and representatives that and, and identity instead of material. You might be asking the question, what about Genesis 1 through 11 and history? Are you saying that this is somehow symbolic or metaphorical and that it's not history? I know, you're all sitting there saying, no, no, I wasn't asking that question. Yeah, you were. You were. Okay. <laughs> Are we dealing with history in Genesis 1 through 11? Let's talk about it. Okay, so a couple things to, to put on the board here. First of all, you can't set up dichotomies. Like, well, is it history or is it myth? Uh, it doesn't have to be either of those. Those are two possible categories. There might be dozens of other categories. So don't over dichotomize. Likewise, well, it's not poetical, so it must be history. No, there are lots of other categories. Just because it's not poetry doesn't mean it's history. Okay, so we have to think about what categories we have. Just as we impose ideas on the ancient cultural river from ours, we can impose labels, even genre labels, our cultural river onto theirs. So we have to be careful to try to understand the text the way they would have understood it. Behind the question of whether Genesis is real history is a concern for truth. And certainly you haven't heard me say anything that would suggest that Genesis is not true. But truth can be packaged in many different ways. And we have to try to be alert to how Genesis is packaging it. And it may not use the kind of packaging that we use. So by all means, affirm Genesis as truth. I do, and I encourage others to do so as well. Truth is found in the narrator's interpretation. Again, remember, God has moved in these narrators these authors of scripture, to produce the message that he wants us to have. And the narrators of scripture are typically interpreting the world around them, interpreting the events that take place. It's not the event itself that is of most significance. It is the interpretation of the event. Anybody could have stood there at the side of the Red Sea and watched as Pharaoh's chariots came, trapping the people against the sea. And they could have observed the waters opening up and the Israelites passing through and the Egyptians going in and getting drowned. Anyone could, have of a, anyone could have observed that sequence of events. But what does it mean? How should we interpret that? How should we understand what's going on? It's the biblical narrator that gives us that. The narrator interprets that event. Yahweh, God of Israel, parted those waters in order to bring deliverance to his people and to punish the Egyptian army. That's interpretation. You have to have a real event if you're going to interpret it. But it's not the reality of the event that's most important. It's the interpretation of the event that is most important. And that's what the biblical narrators give us through the inspiration that they enjoy. So we can't necessarily reconstruct events, but we can read how they were interpreted. The author does not concentrate on human history, but on God's plans and purposes. That's what the narrators of Scripture are giving us. God's plans and purposes are being worked out on the scope of time in history, 
But the point is not to reveal history. It's to interpret what happens. So here's how I would assess the difficulty that we have with this question. Reality is greater than history. The minute we want to say something is historical, we are re reducing it to a sequence of events. And any sequence of events to become meaningful needs to be interpreted. And in the ancient world particularly, reality was a bigger thing than the events you could observe. And therefore, for them to interpret what's going on, they have to step into that larger reality. I don't know if we have a good word for that, but it's reductionistic to say, this is history. That packages it in kind of what we think history is and how history w works. I want something that's a little bigger than that. So this is reality. And we can't ask the question, what would the video recorder have seen? Video recorders reduce history to what you can see. And often the biblical writers consider the most important things to be the things you can't see. So again, we have to be careful about imposing our terminology on the text. So what are some of the issues here? When we think about the Bible and science then, we have to think about how we might be able to unbundle things that we that we tend to group together, may, maybe without thinking. Now, I run into this. I mean, I talk about this stuff all over the world, so I talk about it in other cultures. And it's interesting to see how different cultures bundle things differently. When I was speaking in Eastern Europe, they had bundled together communism, atheism, evolution. All one thing. And so if I started talking about how the Bible might be compatible with an evolutionary model, they're shutting down. Because then it sounds like I'm talking about communism and atheism. Now, we bundle things in different ways. In, uh, in Africa, I've been in numerous African countries, and they tend to bundle things like evolution and modern science with colonialism. This is how the Western culture is pushing itself on us. And therefore, to even consider the Bible as having any compatibility with some of these scientific consensuses, they resist it because they've bundled together those things with Western colonialism. When I'm in Asia, what I find is that they bundle it together with the missionary traditions. Most of Asia, of course, was evangelized through American missionaries, European missionaries, who went there, taught the gospel, and taught them more than the gospel, taught them certain interpretations, including often things like young earth, six-day creationism, things of that sort. And that got woven into that gospel, and they received the message from the missionaries, but it was all bundled together. And if you start talking to them about how there might be other ways to think about the scientific issues today, there's resistance, not because of resistance to the science of those issues, but because it feels like they would be betraying those missionaries who brought them the truth of the gospel. We all have ways of bundling. And sometimes we have to figure out, are these things really bundled tightly together? Or can we separate them and consider them independently, individually? In the United States, I find most often people are struggling with the idea of compatibility with evolutionary models, not because they're thinking about the science, but because they're thinking about sin and salvation. 
I'm saying if we accept some, some evolutionary model, then sin and salvation all falls apart and we, we didn't need Christ and all. No, unbundle, unbundle. We all have our bundles. So how can we start thinking about unbundling Genesis and our scientific human origins? We need to try to do this because they're not mutually dependent on one another, even though sometimes they're treated that way. So first of all, we have to separate out biological issues. The question of first and only of the species, certainly it's a question to consider, it's a question to ask, but if Genesis is not doing that, if it's not addressing that, then we have to unbundle that. We have literary issues. So how do we talk about this archetypal role that Adam and Eve had? And how does that come into it? Unbundle that. We have theological issues, sin and salvation. Those are important theological doctrines. And nothing I say, have said or will say this morning, have any effect on the reality of sin and our need for salvation. Okay, but we have to unbundle that as a separate topic. So these things are not essentially interdependent, though they are often made to be. And somebody will say, well, if you give up this, then you're on the slippery slope and you'll be giving up these other things. I don't think that's the case. Not every understanding of Adam as historical has biological implications. I believe that Adam and Eve were real people in a real past. So historical Adam is not a problem to me. But that doesn't mean that they were the first and only of the biological species. Again, unbundling historical Adam from biology. They don't necessarily go together. We have bundled them. So we need to explore what the biblical claims are. Of course, we are not just dealing with the biblical claims in Genesis. We also have to deal with the biblical claims in the New Testament. Although we have to recognize that the New Testament is a different cultural river. See, once the, the ancient Near Eastern cultural river came to a close uh, with the fall of Babylon in 539. It's not like it changed overnight. But the Persians came in, and they took over the whole Babylonian Empire. And Persian culture and religion is very, very different from what had reigned in the ancient world up until that time. So there's a Persian cultural river that comes washing over the land. And so we have that cultural river for two centuries, which gives it a good deal of time to settle in. Then. Alexander <laughs> comes and the Hellenistic Greek world overflows the Persian world and another cultural river comes in. And that Hellenistic cultural river was extremely strong in its currents and extremely insistent that everybody swim along with the tide. And so we hear about the persecutions of the Jews under Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And so for 300 years, that cultural river reigns in this part of the world until you get to Rome. And then there's a Roman cultural river, which, bar which imbibes heavily of the Hellenistic cultural river. But in the New Testament, it's this Greco-Roman cultural river. And that's very, very different from the ancient Near Eastern cultural river. So. The New Testament is going to have information for us, but we always have to read that also within its cultural river. Okay, we need to start drawing this down because I want to give you plenty of time for questions. So how should we think? This is a no-brainer for me. Scripture is clear all through Old Testament, New Testament. God is creator. Mm, but that doesn't tell us all we need to know. That doesn't answer all our questions. It's a conviction we have, and it's, it's firm, immovable. God is the creator. How 
however he might have done it. The statements of Scripture, the claims of Scripture, focus on agency, not mechanism. Agency means God is the agent of creation. What mechanism did he use? Did he use a snap of the fingers? Did he use a blink of the eye? Did he use uh, a decree of the mouth? Of course, Genesis talks about that, the decree. But it doesn't talk about what mechanisms were involved. As long as God is involved at one level of causation or another, he is the most important cause, and he is the creator. We talk about him as the creator of each one of us, but yet you were born, grew in the womb, in a natural process that's not natural at all, because God is just as much agent of natural processes as of those that aren't. In fact, in the biblical ancient cultural river, they didn't draw a distinction between natural and supernatural. God was doing it all. Agency is what the Bible talks about. Mechanism is what science talks about. Science can't say a whole lot about agency. That's above its pay grade. It can say a lot about mechanism, and that's very helpful stuff. But if the Bible's only making claims about agency, and science is only making claims about mechanism, then they aren't making competing claims. They are potentially correlating complementary claims because they're addressing the issue at different levels. However you think the process worked out for God to make humanity, Adam, us, you, we have to recognize something important. God made us to be more than what he made us from. Whether you think that humans come from some primordial pool of amino acids or from some chain of hominids uh, in an evolutionary process or from the actual dust uh, in which God is kneeling to craft us, no matter what you think we came from, the point is, he made us to be more. That's God's creation of us. Whatever the raw materials were, we have transcended those by the creating act of God. He made us to be more than what he made us from. And so a scientist could stand in front of the, the monkey's cages at the zoo and say, I'm nothing more than that. And a secularist viewpoint that has no God in the picture, that's what I am. I'm just another primate. And a Christian, although one who is willing to accept evolutionary models, would stand right next to him and say, there but for the grace of God am I. God made us more than what he made us from. He did it with Israel. The Bible tells us your father is an Amorite, your mother is a Hittite, and you're a wandering Aramean, mixed ethnic stock, not particularly significant. But God took you, chose you as his people, made a covenant with you, gave you the status of his holy people, and he made you more than what he drew you from. That's what God does. And we recognize that about ourselves as well. Paul tells us some of you were murderers and thieves and adulterers. But God took you away from all of that. And you have been crucified with Christ. And yet you live. And God has made you new creation. He's made you more than what he drew you from. 
That's what God does. And so we find that we can look at sort of God's patterns. We can say, you know, evolutionary models could be compatible with that. Now, I'm not trying to endorse an evolutionary model, but we have to talk about whether it's compatible or not. And people will have to make a judgment on the science and decide whether they think it's good science or not. But if we're going to stand up and say, the Bible says this, and therefore I can ado cannot adopt that model, well, you better be clear on what the Bible's claims are and are not. So this isn't a matter of endorsing a science. As a matter of fact, if the headlines tomorrow blared, Evolution proven false. It was all a hoax. There's not really anything that would change in my presentation because I'm not trying to defend scientific conclusions. Some of it's good. Some of it maybe not as good. Some of it needs improvement. Some of it needs reshaping. Fine. I'm not the one doing that. I'm trying to deal with the biblical text and what it claims and what it doesn't. All humanity today traces its identity to Adam and Eve. Whether that means they can trace their genetics or their genealogical line or their biological existence is another matter. And that's not the kind of claim the Bible is making. But we trace our identity to Adam and Eve, however the genetics works out. And I'm really always interested in how things are changing and developing in the genomic world and all that we're learning. And I'm just trying to keep an open mind to see where things go. The acceptance of scientific models does not require rejection of the Bible or of faith. The tent's big enough. The Bible's claims are not of a scientific nature. And therefore, those who, who do decide that the scientific consensus is something that has some strength and, and staying power to it, they don't have to turn away from that because of the Bible. Because the Bible's not making those sorts of claims. Thank you. So we're going to take about the next 12 to 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, and so this will be kind of a speed round if you have questions. If this leaves you wanting more, um, just refer you tomorrow morning. John will be speaking at, uh, we meet at the Phoenix School Area Middle School, 1030, and all the details on the, on the sheet there that you received. Also tonight, we're having a, um, a more intimate reception where we're going to, uh, John's going to share a bit about his faith journey and what he studies more and then more Q&A. We still have about 10 spaces left on that. You'd have to speak with me directly or email me, paul at gvf.church, and um, we still have a couple spaces left. So questions? And by the way, I was raised in Norristown. I grew up around here. Hi, Dr. Walken. I uh, appreciate the presentation. I loved it. Um, so I guess for me, what I still struggle with, um, it's more so on the, the New Testament side, um, I like Romans uh, or um, in Corinthians, where Paul talks about uh, Adam, right, for in him or in the Greek into um, Adam. How, how do we reconcile that? I don't want to take a more radical approach and to say Adam, um, I mean, to say Paul is wrong and say he's a more literalist, but how do we understand Paul when he's um, referencing Adam? Thanks, Isaiah. Good question. And one that's on lots of your minds. I have a slide on the New Testament stuff that's a hidden slide right now. Um, I didn't know how much time I'd have. But so, so, so these are these are speed rounds. So you get about right. two minutes to answer this complex question. <laughs> and if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand, and I'll I'll, I'll come okay. by. Paul is not wrong, <laughs> but Paul is working from his cultural river, and he's trying to answer questions that he has, which is what we do in our cultural rivers. He's asking theological questions, not scientific questions. If we draw scientific implications from it, that's what we are doing, not necessarily what he is doing. 
when he talks about Adam as the first man, he also calls Christ the last. Christ is not biologically the last, and so why should we think that he's talking about Adam as biologically the first? Again, he's in a cultural river, he's answering a different set of questions, and we have to make sure that we read him carefully. Well, was that two minutes? Okay. <laughs> uh, when talking about the history, whether or not Genesis 1 to 11 is historical or not, um, Genesis 5 gives us an account from Adam to Noah. It's very specific. It talks about their age at death and then the descendant that carried on the biblical narrative. And then Genesis 10 gives us an account from Noah to Abraham. And then Matthew 1 actually gives mm -hmm. us an account from Abraham to Jesus. So it seems mm -hmm. to be a collective genealogy from Genesis 5 all the way to Matthew 1. So if we don't take Genesis 5 or 10 as historical truth, then how does that connect to Matthew 1? How do you reconcile that? Mm -hmm. um, there's no question that the genealogies bring it into the world of history. Uh, but we don't have to treat everything as genealogy just because there are genealogies among it. Okay, there are genealogies that the New Testament authors write, but all of the Gospels are not genealogies. Okay, so we have to take each section for, for what it is. I take the genealogies seriously, but I also take them within their cultural river, and they are not treating genealogies the same way we treat genealogies. They're not doing the same things with them, and they don't operate them the same way. So, for instance, we're very familiar with the fact that the genealogies in the New Testament skip lots of generations that we know from the Old Testament. That's okay. Uh, they're not doing the same thing with genealogies that we do. But certainly it gives a rooting in the reality of events, and I'm not denying that. But we still have to take every section as what it is. Good question. So um, I, right before you said it, I felt like you were pulling the Bible out of our hands for a moment uh, when you talked about the authority of the Bible and the authority of the author. What do you feel is the authority of the modern believer and in two minutes, the role of the Holy Spirit in interpreting that for us. Good, thank you. Um, of course, we don't have authority. Um, as interpreters, interpreters don't have authority. The text has authority, that's by virtue of inspiration, and the Bible makes clear that connection. So I treat the text as having authority. My interpretations are open to question and don't have authority. What about the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit cannot be used as an appeal to authority. Now, you can't say the Holy Spirit, of course, the Holy Spirit's God, so we take the Holy Spirit seriously, but there's no forensic interpretation going on at that point. If you say, um, well, uh, this passage says this, but the Holy Spirit told me that it means this, that can't be an appeal to authority. You can't say, and therefore I'm right, because anybody else can claim the Holy Spirit told them anything else. So the Holy Spirit is important as it might guide us in our interpretation. And when I interpret, I, I'm counting on the fact that the Holy Spirit is helping me see things. The Holy Spirit is helping me to think clearly. But when I get to the end, I can't say, and this is right because the Holy Spirit told me. So that's a difference. The Holy Spirit has a role, although the main role of the Holy Spirit is to help us take that message that he already put there through the biblical author and to take that and appropriate it for our cultural river, convicting us, driving us to be better people, that's the main role of the Holy Spirit. So can't be appealed to authority, but certainly can influence our thinking and should drive us to be better people. And everyone should read their Bible. <laughs> Thanks for your talk. Uh, you floated the idea of Adam being a historical person, but not the first human. Um, and I'm wondering, why you think that considering in, in Genesis 2 you have um, God taking such a um, formative role in creating Adam in the text and also being embedded in the creation of vegetation, the creation of bees, presumably also the creation of man? Well, he spends an awful lot of time with Abraham, too, uh, to, to communicate uh, yet another level of identity, identity of his covenant people. That's not biological. Although, again, they're descendants of Abraham, but it makes that case in the covenant. Uh, why does he spend so much time with Adam? Well, if, if he's using Adam and Eve, who are priestly representatives, to describe the identity, the core identity of human beings, that's worth the time. That's something that everybody always wants to know. So 
Again, the biological question is the way we sometimes frame that, but it's not the way they framed it, and it's not the most important way. Yes, how can you be a follower of Christ and believe in evolution? It's not my job to defend evolution, and I'm not here to defend evolution, but I can be a follower of Christ because I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior and commit to following him. And furthermore, I live out that Christianity by treating the text seriously as God's authoritative word. Now, if it turns out that all of those things are compatible with an evolutionary model where God is creating, yet evolution is happening, if that all is compatible, then you certainly can be a follower of Christ and accept an evolutionary model. Again, I don't go around promoting evolutionary models, but I know there are some people that are wondering about those things and struggling with those things, and so I talk about that compatibility that can exist. Okay, so I'm not here to endorse the science. You could, be, you could be a very good Christian and adopt an evolutionary model. I know plenty of them. So I have more of a methodology question, or uh, methodology. You mentioned reading instinctively is not really reliable, uh, and we need to read from their cultural river. So from a practical standpoint, I'm not a professor of ancient Near Eastern literature. I suspect most of us aren't. How do we go about getting into that cultural river in a uh, more accessible way? <laughs> That's the question he was waiting for. Boy, have I got some books for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I've spent my whole life producing not, not scholarly academic stuff for the guild. I do some of that, but mostly focusing on how we can make this information, which I consider vitally important, accessible and available to folks in the church who just want to know better and do better. So there's this thing, I don't know if I've mentioned it, called the Cultural Background Study Bible. <laughs> <laughs> but the Lost World series is also doing this in, in a variety of ways. They're controversial books, the Lost World books. No question about it. They're controversial books. Okay, but we've, we've got to tackle the issue and try to make some sense of it. And I'd rather be doing it as someone who really comes from the position of biblical authority and a firm Christian conviction than let somebody else do it who might not have those convictions. So thanks, John, for a great presentation. Um, I, wanna, I also want to go back to the first methodological part. And uh, clearly it's important for us to understand the original author's intentions when we're trying to understand what the mm -hmm. text is trying to communicate. Um, and the worry is if you don't do that, then you're just imposing your own cultural river on the text and therefore per perhaps misunderstanding it. That's possible. Yeah. But there are, um, it seems to me, there are cases where um, what God intends to teach by the text in some cases is less than what the human author intends to, uh, to communicate, and in some cases more. So here's the two examples. In Joshua 10, when um, the text tells us that the sun stopped in its motion across the sky, I think what the author intended to say was the sun was doing something. It was moving in a certain way, and uh, God did something miraculous that uh, led it to stop. That's not an accurate depiction of what took place. Um, and so I think what the author meant to communicate is actually something that's literally false. Um, but we can understand it in a different way so that we can get the picture of what really took place. On the other hand, there are cases where it's, I, th I think there's something more that's being affirmed. So, for example, in the account of Joseph, I think that, um, that God's trying to teach us something about Joseph as a type of Christ. But I don't think the author of Genesis intended to communicate that. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But uh, those two cases seem to me, on the one hand, less and on the one hand, more. So I wonder, you know, wh where, do we, where do we draw those lines and, and how far does uh, authorial intent take us? Well, in those particular examples, I would see things a little bit differently in each case. That is, uh, the sun and moon in Joshua, I don't view through the world of physics. That's our cultural river about you know moving heavenly bodies and whether the sun is moving or the earth is moving and, and them stopping. Instead, I look to the ancient Near Eastern divination literature and find that they talk all the time about sun and moon stopping and waiting and, and standing. And so I ask, what did they mean by that? Because they're not talking the world of physics. And so that language is from the world of divination. And that changes what it is that Joshua is asking for. Uh, 
and Joshua's asking for a particular kind of sign, and he receives it, and it has its effect. Again, I can't go through the whole interpretation here. Cultural background, study Bible. But, um, so I, I would see that a little bit differently in that case. With Joseph as a type of Christ, um, I'm not really willing to see anybody as a type of Christ unless the New Testament tells me so. And so if the New Testament tells me so, then there's more there that I can get on a, an authoritative voice and I can go that direction. Anything else, if I'm doing it on my own, and even if lots of other people agree with me, um, that still becomes my imagination. And it wouldn't carry the same authority as I'm trying to understand the text. Um, so in that sense, I would not uh, be willing to go with that kind of typology without an authoritative voice behind it. So I'd look at the New Testament. So. All right, we're gonna do one, one more question and then we'll, we'll hang out here afterwards. Then we'll this is kind of getting back to the methodology. So I'm thinking, okay, we have the cultural study Bible as English speakers. And, but I'm thinking about the tribes in New Guinea or other places that barely can get the Bible. How in the world are they supposed to interpret it properly? Good, thank you. That's a great question. And you know, you can look back, you know, we've only had this ancient Near Eastern stuff for the last 150 years. Um, and it hasn't been really accessible in, until much more recently. So what about all these people who never had access to this stuff? Whether it's people in other times or in other places in the world. And so I'm glad you asked that because it gives me a chance to say something that's very important to maybe um, bring a climax to this conversation. Even when we do not have the tools or the resources or the access to do everything that we would want to do, uh, our responsibility is to do our best. And we found through history that God can use those attempts, as much as they may be stutter steps or even uninformed, God can yet use those to carry out his plans and purposes. In other words, we are responsible for faithful interpretation, but God is not limited to our absolutely correct interpretation. He can work through a variety of means in a variety of ways and get his work done. So just as a quick example, um, some of you, undoubtedly, in a group this size, uh, came to Christ being challenged by reading Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, right? And you were impressed with that, and you opened up the door of your heart to invite Christ in. Now, the th truth of your salvation is not dependent on the awkward fact that in Revelation 3, he's talking to Christians. And so he's not talking about trying to get you to open your heart to God. He's talking about Christians. It's a letter to the churches. And so that, that's not a particularly good interpretation of that verse. But it's all right. You're saved anyway. Amen. <laughs> okay? So even in our stumbling steps, God can still use his word with power. And that should never be something that tells us, well, I'm not going to use these other tools because these other people didn't have them. We are responsible to do the best with what we have. And God will God will work with people who have other situations. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. We'll be hanging out up here for a few more minutes if you want to ask questions. And also, if you, if I'm sure a lot of unanswered questions here. So if you want to come to the reception tonight, um, grab me or email me. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for us, if you don't mind. Uh, Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. I, I pray, Lord, that um, this will be helpful and not hurtful. I pray that people will, uh, will step out of here with their minds expanded and with bigger hearts, that they'll come exploring after you. Um, and Lord, pray that you'll, you'll uh, in particular, I just want to pray for those who, who are struggling in our culture and in this room with how faith and science fit together. Lord, we know that all truth is your truth and just uh, come in humility asking for you to lead us in that way. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.